one that gives me the cute background. Welcome back to Front End Wednesdays. I'm at the Derek. <laughs> what if I only went by my Twitter handle, like in just at parties and stuff? Like, hey, I'm at the Derek. <laughs> I am so confused about the, like this post COVID digital work from home, remote work, um, blend of like, like I'm streaming from a bedroom and it's not even the bedroom I sleep in. Like life's just confusing. Am I right, Beam? Beam, once I know, cause you and I were on Telegram, right? Like once I know people's, uh, first names, it's so hard not to dox them just cause like exactly the thing I'm talking about. Like I want to refer to you by your state name and not your chosen username, but I'm not trying to dox you like that. Like that's a horrible assumption to make that somebody would be okay with that. I did it. I did it with DC nine the other day. I referred to him by his name cause he and I have traveled internationally together. I was like, Hey, what's up name? And he was like, Whoa, Whoa, whoa chill. I'm Denver citizen nine. And I was like, Oh my bad, my bad. <laughs> so it's just how it goes. Speaking of names, I'm curious who's here. Um, give me a GM in the chat if you're watching live, because I know there's at least a few of you and I'm curious who it is. Did you know we have a special guest tomorrow? Hey, Suede. Good to see you. Juan Geraldo. Welcome back. The Scoho. Who's the Scoho? I've seen you before, but how do I know you? What's your discord name? Welcome, Josh Long. GM. Well, afternoon. Um, special guest tomorrow, by the way. Uh, yesterday was Cami Ramos from Fuel Labs. Shout outs to Cami at Cami in this thing on Twitter. She was amazing. Go watch the VOD if you missed it. And um, today, just me, just us, rather. And we're um, going to be digging back into that React tutorial, that tic tac toe, picking up right where we left off so that we can sharpen our skills, talk about components, state, props refactoring, JSX, boom, bang, boom, and getting really confused and lost along the way. And every now and then doing a pull request for a small typo on the React Docs tutorial repo and feeling really proud of ourselves for being a contributor to a GitHub that important. Uh, and then tomorrow, bit of a pivot, just so you know where we're going this week. I'm giving you the like weekly calendar before we dig into the front end Wednesdays. So tomorrow, uh, instead of being design Thursdays, I'll admit I had a hard time figuring out what to do with that because my background's not designed. So I'll take the L. I, I had an idea and it didn't go great, but there's a pivot. Instead, uh, because I love alliteration, it's now Theory Thursdays. And on Thursdays, I'm going to be bringing on guests to tell us about things at a little more of a conceptual level, a little more like the, the what, the why, rather than like the how and the implementation. That being said, we're going to bridge both of those because tomorrow we're learning about Lens Protocol and Lenster with Nother Dobbit. Has anyone ever heard of Nother Dobbit? I definitely have an, um, a non-surprise celebrity crush on him. So I feel very fortunate that I'm going to have him on as a guest tomorrow. And we're going to learn about um, Lens, both kind of like how it's architectured at the theoretical level and also I think there will be time for a quick little, and let's see how to interact with Lens with their React SDK. So we're actually going to get get into the weeds too. So this is why we're here today learning the language of React so that tomorrow when Nother's like, and then here's how I use the React SDK to like import this library and pass the props to this component, we're like, I know what those words mean. I did that for tic-tac-toe yesterday. So that's our goal. Um, last thing on the calendar this week is Friday. If you missed last Friday, it was the first of a series. Basically, what used to be the community call has now morphed into the, um, what are we calling it? Road to ETH Denver, raise your sporks <laughs> weekly series. Uh, it's on Twitch instead of on Discord. We keep bouncing it around. Y'all are pretty flexible. Like we've done Twitter spaces. We've done Discord. We've done Twitch. We've done YouTube. So um, that'll be on Twitch and YouTube and Twitter. Um, let me double check my time. I think it's 1 p.m. Mountain on Friday. Correct. 1 p.m. Mountain on Friday. Everything is Denver time-based, of course, here at ETH Denver. And um, last week, we spoke at a high level about the Biddle-a-thon, what to expect, uh, prizes, venue, and 
I actually have my notes right here. We did not quite get to talking about judging, how judging is going to go down for those of you that like to play the meta and optimize your chance for getting some sweet bounties. We didn't talk about mentorship um, and what kinds of sweet support you're going to have from like world-class experts in Web3 that just like being generous with their time, kind of like the guests that we have here. And then team formation, a crucial topic to make sure that y'all have um, friends to biddle with at ETH Denver. Is anyone here for sure going to come to ETH Denver? Give me a yes in the chat if you're for sure coming. Or at least like strong intention plan A is yes. Give me Chad yes in the chat if you intend to come. Okay, Merman, not sure what days. That's fair. It's 10 days long and uh, hotels are not free usually. Suede's going to be there. Juan Geraldo's going to be there. Fantastic. I will look like this. And so if you see me, I'm not saying this as a joke. There's not that many of us here. I mean this from the bottom of my heart. If you see me, please come up and say, hey, I'm Juan Geraldo. Or I mean, Suede, I would recognize you. But like uh, Merman or like Josh Zong, I don't think we've met in person. I would love if you came up and were like, yo, what's up? I'm Merman. Nice to meet you. Oh, Merman's local. Lucky duck. Uh, and Beam especially. I want you to give me a tackle hug anime style. That would be my dream come true. Okay. That's my announcements. If you forgot everything I just said, the important part was Nother's coming on tomorrow. Uh, before we get into the React last thing, shameless self-promotion. I need your help. I need your help making sure folks know this is happening. So please, and thank you, take that tweet. Take that tweet, which is this tweet. Uh, da -da. Yes. This tweet. From East Denver, telling people this stream is happening right now. Hey, look, it's my buffcorn. Would y'all like to hear my really dramatic buffcorn story? Uh, there was like a, an emotional roller coaster over the last couple weeks related to my most prized NFT and an accidental rug. If people want to hear that story, it's a, it's a beautiful story about um, loss and friendship and uh, a special guest that we're going to have coming up soon. Well, I don't know. I accidentally rugged myself. Okay, quick Lost Buffy story. So I'm Derek. I go on OpenSea. Now, I am famously paper-handed in this space. Not a diamond hands. I've bought and sold buff corns over and over and over. A lot of my coworkers are like, hey, you paper hands, SOB, can't believe you uh, can't believe you sell them ever. I'm like, joke's on you. I buy them at 0.05 in the off season and sell them at 0.1 when the event gets close and take my 2X and move on with my life. Like, I'm a member of the community. I can have my own liquidity and my sovereignty. Get off my back. So what I did is I went over to my wallet just like this. Don't look at that. Very rude. Very private. And uh, most of that ETH is from selling buff corns. And uh, it was this one. Hacked for D20 die. Now, just to give you a sense of buff corns and the relative rarity of this one, it's super rare. And it was given to me. Uh, I got one buff corn in exchange for all the work I did for ETH Denver and, of course, money. And they were like, here's your buff corn. Thank you for working literally 100-hour work weeks. And it was this one. So this one's sentimental to me in addition to being rare in the set. And I was doing that classic thing where you're like, well, I don't want to sell it, but I'll list it for like five ETH. Like if someone wants to give me five ETH, okay. You can pry it out of my cold dead hands for five ETH, sure. And in the process of doing that, I accidentally listed it. Where's, where's history? Price history? Yeah. The day before New Year's Eve, I accidentally listed it at 0 0.15 ETH. I don't know how. I was like, I put in five ETH. And then as I was doing it, there were like two signatures to sign in a row. And that's where I knew something was weird. And within less than five minutes, I got an email saying, congrats, your item sold for 0.15 ETH. And my heart sank. I was like, what happened? I don't understand. This is my favorite thing. I thought I just sold it for five. How did it just sell? 
or I thought I listed it for five. How did it just sell for 0.15? This makes no sense. And then I looked at the wallet and realized that this person had a lot of buff corns, more than 160. And I know where to go when I want to talk to somebody that has more than 160 buff corns. I go to the secret Discord channel, BBB or B3 Whale Lounge, <laughs> in our Discord. Now, some of you might not know that, but here's like the Discord link. Go form a team. But I was over in the Discord and I go to the secret channel for secret people that have 20 or more buff corns. If you have 20 or more buff corns in your wallet and you collect a collab land, there's a role we don't tell you about, but you can see some other people have it with their yellow name called a BBB Whale, something like that. And it's just for people that have a lot of them. And there's just one channel where we can talk to each other and be like, dang, can't believe how much I spent on buff accords. How about you guys? <laughs> That's all it is. Um, but it's a pretty tight knit group. There's like six of us that have been there for like a year. So we know who each other are, in other words. So I go over there and I'm like, hey, I made a mistake. And it was with you, Ping, Tag. Any chance we could like work this out and you could help me just switch it right back? And, you know, I'm coming in optimistic. Like, maybe we can resort this or, like, figure it out at layer zero. That was my hope. I hear nothing back for over a week. I'm crestfallen. I'm like, all right, this is it. I do not get my buff corn back. And then a week later, this person writes back to me and is like, hey, I made a private listing. It's a little more than 0.15. It's like 0.17 just to cover the gas and stuff. Of course you can have it back. I really appreciate like the safe, warm space you create for this community. And I just wanted to honor that and give it right back to you. And if there's anything I can do, here's my background. If I can be of any service to the community, just let me know. I was floored. That is the best news I've gotten in the last three weeks. Because this was the worst thing that happened in the last three weeks. I, I've gotten offers like, um, uh, yeah, like Army of the 12 Monkeys said, I made, uh, I made, I've made offers on this. You can see there's currently an offer on it. I had an offer for like 0.6 ETH. You know, I think it's like easily one or two ETH in the long run. So I'm here accidentally selling something that I think is worth, say, one to $3,000 for like 150 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever crestfallen that's like rent money you know this is serious he gives it back and um will be coming on stream soon because uh he has amazing design experience and i mentioned a uh, a moment ago that we have a dearth of like people with design expertise in web3 and so i was like win 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 i got validated this person's gonna come on stream and i get my buffcorn back i love this community <laughs> so i wanted to share that because this is um, this is a community I'm proud to be a part of. And it's stories like that that make that a, a true thing I feel from the bottom of my heart and not just some BS I say because of my role as community steward. Like, I could have a different job. Like, I like being here a lot because of you specifically, those of you that are watching, like Suede and Beam and Merman. That's why I like being here. This is my favorite part of my day is just like, streaming and hanging out with y'all and learning some stuff after this i gotta go do spreadsheets Ugh. so let's get back to our tutorial yeah where do we leave off um well we we're in the beta docs and we had done the quick start in week one this is week i want to say three of front end wednesdays Maybe four, because we've gotten pretty far in the second thing we started, which is their make a tic-tac-toe game tutorial. And so we're going to jump back into that in a moment. Give me a second while I pull it up. Bada boom. And then uh, this will be fun. We'll use a trick that um, Frank and Miller taught us last time, or did yeah, I think Frankie Miller taught us. So my screen again. The trick that I'm trying to do here is I'm going to go to my GitHub. And I want to open an, an editor in window. I could use VS Code. 
skip. And that'd be fine. There's my tic-tac-toe. Dang it. But did you know if you go to any repo, maybe it has to be a repo you own, and at where it says github.com, if you instead change it to say githubbox.com, Code Sandbox does a fun little game. And as I do this, it switches over to codesandbox.io slash blah, 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 and it loads in this repo. And already we've got our IDE going. I collapse this pane. Get out of here. There we go. My files, my app. Mm -hmm. And my code. Okay, can we tolerate this text size? I'm going to need a yes or a no, or a thumbs up or a thumbs down from everyone on text size before I move on. Okay, and then for this, let's make it a little bigger. There we go. Nice. So let's figure out where we left off. I think it was the beginning of the time travel part. Uh, there we go. Time travel. So do we have a winner? We'll check that we have a winner and confirm that we left off where I think we left off and then we're gonna do adding time travel. Okay. Do we have a winner? X, O, X, O, X. We do. And that concludes setting the table. Let's dive back in. So what we currently have is a tic-tac-toe game which is represented here on the right side in our development environment. This is like what it would look like on the website when somebody loads it up in their browser of choice, such as Brave. And what we're gonna do is uh, remind ourselves what features we have and then talk about what feature we wanna do next and then figure out how to implement it. What we currently have is a tic-tac-toe game that is comprised of a board. Everything is happening here in app.js. If you're not used to this, File structure, we made a React app, and all we need to change is app.js. Everything else we can ignore. You can go change it if you want, if you know what the things are, but the good news is you can ignore it. So all of our attention is limited to app.js. And specifically, um, we have a couple functions. Let's take a look at this file. So we have an import statement at the top. Specifically, this is helping us keep track of state and updating it using React's very opinionated way of doing that, which at first is awkward because if you're coming from JavaScript, you're like, const var, const var name equals five, done. And React's like, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. You need to use hooks. Where's your getter and your setter? <laughs> you're like, okay, okay, I didn't mean to make you mad, I'm sorry. But there's a reason you do that. It's you get all the benefits of React and it magically updating your front end when state changes and stuff. So we learn its opinions, which we'll see in a moment. And we have three functions at this point. The board, which keeps track of the entire board. The board is made of squares, which you can see here in the return. This is JSX. It kind of looks like HTML, but it's got some fancy stuff inside, specifically these square components. We have nine square components here, three on each row, each board row. What is a square? Well, the code got kind of gnarly, so we made a board separate than a square. A square is a button, and the button does something when you click it. What does it do when you click it? It does handle click. What's handle click? Uh, we made that up, and that's the other function. What handle click does is... Uh, Keep track of the X's and O's in a fancy way that's not worth completely summarizing right now. It handles when you click, making that look like an X and keeping track of the, the turns like X, O, X, O, X, O. Um, it also updates to know that the next thing when you click, it should not be an X, it should be an O now. That's happening right here as kept track of by this variable X is next, 
which is either true or false, depending on whether X is the next thing to get placed. And then lastly, at the end of last week, we added this new thing, this variable called winner, excuse me, this, yeah, this is a very, I'm just surprised this is not being handled in a use state kind of way. We can do that. Really? So const winner equals calculate winner of squares. Squares, by the way, is an array of all nine of these squares, whether they are empty, which is represented by null, or filled with the string X, like quote, capital X, end quote, or the string capital O, like quote, capital O, end quote. Like that. So uh, we had to tell it, what are all the ways to win? And where did I put all the wins? Yeah, here's calculate winner. These are all the different ways to win. If these match, like if, if square zero, square one, and square two are all the same thing, in this case, square zero, square one, and square two are all X, then down here, it's checking specifically right here whether those are all matching and also as a side note not matching it empty that they start matching empty we don't want to count that one so if they match as something that's not empty specifically x or o then you have a winner and then that updates here that's the beauty of react it automatically updated what we're displaying on the screen um, where's the JSX for showing the winner? Right here, status. So status is where we're keeping track of that. And status is changing between winner colon and then X or next player X or O. So the status thing is pretty cool. This is the power of React right here. Here is the status thing. So it's like right here. This lets us, es they call it escape into JavaScript with the curly brace. And instead of doing HTML, now we're doing JavaScript and we're just representing this status. And then that can update automatically to display different stuff depending on the state of variables, such as whether there's a winner. Super cool. Super cool. <laughs> All right, enough setting the table. Let's add time travel. So our goal is just to show you, some people like the mental model. Let's save this so I can come back to it. When, when we're done adding time travel, we'll have something like this. We'll have something like this over on the side. Time travel lets us, first of all, go back in time. For example, what was the board like at move five? It also lets us go forward in time. What was the board like when the game ended? And just like any sci-fi that's dealing with time travel, it has to make a decision about how it handles going back in time and then changing the future. Notice that it dropped all those moves. It's aware we're in a new timeline. Pretty fancy. So we're gonna implement this thing that lets us jump back and forward, or after we jump back, change the course of history. And we're gonna do that by keeping track of the state at each turn, so that in the future, after we update state, we don't lose what state was. In other words, we're gonna make an array of the entire state of things at each turn. Let's do it. So squares, that's where we're currently keeping track of state. It's this array of squares zero through eight. Computers count at zero. So instead of saying one through nine, we say zero through eight. If we mutated or updated that directly, well then we'd lose what it was right before we updated it. So the, what we're currently doing, which is already a BASP, best practice is we're not mutating it directly 
We're using slice just to create a full copy of the array. And then we're updating that copy and then we're saving that copy as what square should be now. It's a bit of a two-step process, but that saves us the trouble of mutating it directly. All we have to do is make a slight change to how we're doing it. And instead of updating, uh, or in addition to updating squares, which is how things are now, we're also going to update this thing called history. And instead of overwriting squares, well, in addition to overwriting squares, over on history, it's going to be this list where each entry in the array is itself an array of the entire board. In other words, history will have, what's the biggest number of turns you could have? Nine turns. So history will be an array that could be up to nine long. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And at index zero in this history array, index zero will itself be an entire array. I like to think of it like columns and rows because we're dealing with an array within an array. So if history is this thing that goes down, then at each spot in history, it can go across and be an entire array of the entire board. For example, uh, x, zero x, blank, 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 blank. That could be how things were at turn three. So we're gonna keep track of these arrays of the entire board, one after the other, in itself a larger array called history. Sure enough, square bracket for array. What's the first thing in the array? An array. What's in that? A blank board, comma, which means next thing in the big array, and then the next thing in the big array, which is a smaller array. Blank, 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 blank. Ah, they clicked X on one, two, three, four, five, the fifth square. Oh, if I'm gonna be consistent with last week, I should call this one the zeroth square. This one is the zeroth square. <laughs> the squares go zeroth, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. That way I don't have to switch between zero to eight and one to nine language. I'm gonna to try to keep it in zero to eight language, even though it's a little awkward. That way we don't get confused when we talk about the arrays, which have at spot zero is where the first one is instead of at spot one. Okay, so we're gonna refactor. We're gonna lift state up. Before the state of each square was stored in square, but then that limited our ability to figure out who the winner was. So we lifted state up to the level of board, which is keeping track of all squares and passing state down to each square. Board is in charge of what each square is and sends it down to the square. That's all fine and good, but now we need a thing called game, a top level component above board, which will keep track of the history of what board looked like at each turn. In other words, we're gonna lift the state of squares, which is the current game state, all nine squares, up out of board and into a new thing that doesn't exist yet called game. And then once it's up there, it will get passed down into board. That's the refactor we're about to do. Okay. Here's our game. Have it render the board component inside some markup. Ooh. Ooh. We're going to copy this instead of type it, but we are going to look at it. So this is our new export default. We cannot have two defaults. <laughs> oh no, what have I done? Okay, interesting. Why is there so much dead space over here? Huh. So now we have a new component called game, capital G. There's no logic before the return statement, there's nothing here, and we return or display a div, which has the class name game that ends here. And then a thing, 
another div called game board. <laughs> That's where board lives. And then uh, a class name called game info. And then this uh, OL, if you're not familiar with HTML, OL is an ordered list. You make these all the time in any kind of text editor or notes app. That's the kind of list that goes one, two, three, four, five, as opposed to an unordered list, which would be listed UL here in HTML. That is where it's just like a bunch of dashes in a row or a bunch of circles in a row. There's no order to them. It's just a list of things. So you use them all the time. Now you know what they're called, unordered lists and ordered lists. And this is our to-do. This is where we're going to write some code right now. If you're curious what class name game is, uh, just a quick aside, they gave us the styles.css that had game and game info. We didn't write this and uh, we had not used it at all until this moment and now we're using it. We didn't even need to know that, but just for your edification, we did not define game. It The, the class, the CSS class, it already existed over in styles.css. So, We've got our game and nothing's broken, which is nice. <laughs> Usually when you make a big change like this, something breaks. That's why we have extra divs. I was like, this is a lot of divs. Like we could totally get away with like not doing that and not doing that. Oh, is this two things next to each other? Yes, it is. Oh, so we don't have to do that, or that, or this, or this, or this. We could just have the board. This is what I expected us to start with, but we're actually adding below this div or this area on the screen, another thing, which is currently blank. Hi. Um, oh, I see. Hi. And then wrapping it all in a div because you're only allowed to export one thing. So this thing is living over here. Hi. I'm going to be a list someday. So this is where our turn order list is going to be. This is a placeholder for that. All right. Let's jam. So... We're lifting state up. Our goal is to bring the game state as currently represented by the array squares here within the board component. We want to change things around or refactor our code so that squares now lives up here in the game component. As always, I'm going to waste time by guessing how that will go because as a person trying to actually learn and understand this stuff, it is way better cognitively to guess what you're about to learn and make your brain work on using its current understanding to make a mental model. Even if you're super wrong, at least you have an expectation so that when you look at the answer and it doesn't match that expectation, your reaction is, wait, what? Instead of, okay, sure, because you didn't have any expectation. So let's guess. What I'm going to do is take squares and just cut this line and bring it way up here. Good job. And now I'm getting an error. Squares is not defined here at uh, 46, character 33, line 46 or so. Here we go. Squares. Why are we getting this error? Because squares no longer exists at the level of board. Let's take it from the level of game and pass it down into board as we declare board right here. I forgot the syntax, but the good news is this is so similar to what we did here when board had to pass it down into square. So I think we go value equals this. It'll be something very similar to this. Value equals this. And instead of passing one part of the array, I wanna pass the whole array. Oh, you didn't like that? What about that? But, okay. So that's passing it down, or at least my guess. And now, how do I receive it? 
the board doesn't know to receive it yet. Squares. You're going to receive... Oh, done. <laughs> I'm a god. <laughs> we got lucky. Um, I wonder if X is next will also move up. It will. Let's move X is next. Goodbye. Moving it up from the board up to this new top level component called game. And then also passing it down. Value equals squares. And X is next. Whoa. Where is it not defined? What are you talking about? Up, oh, sure enough, I forgot to receive it. Oh, sometimes it works and it just feels so good. Okay. So we just made two major changes. Um, Uh-oh, that's a clue. We never use set squares. Um, maybe set squares did not get passed down. Let's check whether we're able to click a square and have it show x and also update this to say next player oh nope <laughs> okay life was not as easy as we thought and now we're back to reality so what else do we have to do let's let them actually tell us so there are things slightly different than mine they did x is next up at the game level just like i did yep 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 i'll make mine up at the top like theirs so so far so good we agree what else? History and set history. A new thing. Let's get this far. So this is going to be our new array of arrays that we looked at a moment ago. And what are we going to initialize it as? This is an array that is up to nine long because of uh, that's the number of turns. And I want to start by filling it. Before when we make the squares array, which is one array, it's filled with nulls. But I want this to be an array that's nine long where what it's filled with at each spot is also an array that's nine long, that's filled with nulls. So this is getting a little recursive. Um, I wonder if I can go... this. I want it to be filled with a bunch of these. Okay, it didn't scream at me. That's a good start. Array, huh, no, that's not quite how they did it. Hello? An array. Is an array with a single item, which itself is an array of nine nulls. Oh, so they're starting it out not as an array that's nine long filled with arrays, they're filling it, it's it's an array that only has one thing in it, but the one thing in it is an array that is nine long also. Or it's an array that's one long. It's this and only this is inside. It's an array with only one thing inside and the one thing inside is an array also. But that inner array is nine long and filled with nulls rather than the outer array, which is one long and filled with an array. I need to go super slow for this kind of stuff because this is definitely what was hard for me when I was first learning JavaScript. Okay, watch that. We're just going to let them tell us how they did it. Okay, lovely. So what do we show on screen now? Well, whatever the most recent thing in history is.
How do we do that? Current squares, this is a new thing we're declaring here called current squares. And it's going to read out the history array. It's going to grab one piece of it. In other words, instead of the whole history array, we're going inside the history array and just grabbing one of its indices. Remember, each of those indices is itself an array of nine. So by the time we're done with this, current squares will be one array that's nine long, the board state. And here we play a little trick called history.length minus one, which for those of you that have done uh, free code camps, JavaScript tutorials, highly recommend if you don't know JavaScript, just jamming through all of these. That's how I got to where I am, self-taught. Highly recommend, very interactive. Takes you, takes you pretty deep. Couple, couple hundreds of really quick bite size, really important things in here. So I'm not going to dig into. Um, thank you for asking, Merman. Yeah. So when you see history dot length minus one, the short answer is this checks how long history is. Are we five moves in? Are we nine moves in? And whatever the answer is. Oh, this array is nine long. Instead of saying, give me the ninth thing, that would throw an error because computers start counting at zero. So the ninth thing is in a spot called the eighth spot because the first thing is in a spot called the zeroth spot. So this is how you say in JavaScript, give me the last one. You have to do this minus one thing just because the counting starts at zero. All right, let's add our current squares. I'm being a little more copy pasta today done. But what about squares? Oh my God, do we not need it anymore? <sighs> Let's pretend we don't need it for a while. And we pass down current squares instead. And then it breaks. Wait, what? You can do that? Board is okay with receiving it? Does board not care what the name is? That's crazy. They can have different names and what matters is the order and you can rename as you receive them. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Current squares, weird name. Doesn't break anything. Oh, wait, what? Oh yeah, as long as it matches from here and here. Cool. State can have different names as it gets passed between different components as long as the components are internally consistent. Or said another way, up at the game level, we call this array current squares. And then that same array at the board level is called something different, squares. And it doesn't break. We didn't even have to say squares equals current squares or anything. We just called it squares right here as we imported or received it. Super cool. All right. Let's make a handle play function inside game that board will call. Right now we have the handle click thing going on. We're refactoring that. Pass X is next, current squares, and handle play as props to board. Okay, so we need to make handle play. We'll do that in a moment. I'm just gonna go ahead and get rid of the squares thing. That's wild. And we're gonna pass down handle play. Um, do I pass it just like this? Do I, in other words, do I pass functions the same way I pass variables or do I need to do like that? You know what I mean? Oh, doesn't it get called a million times if I don't do something specific? Yeah, exactly. I wonder if it's on square click. Let's go check. So how should we actually be passing this down? Board. Whoa. I was supposed to do it like that. <laughs> and on play, handle play. Okay, so the answer to my question is no. You did not need different syntax. You just name it. And something I did not realize was you can name it that explicitly. Wait, value isn't the general thing? What? I thought that was a React thing. That's just a random thing? 
What? Oh my god, it is just a general thing. Oh, okay. Cool. So, here for our board, instead of writing it that way, what are we going to pass down? We're going to pass down three things. Uh, whoops. X is next. We are not changing its name. Something called squares. As far as board is concerned, it's receiving something called squares. That's right. It expects something called squares. And it expects something that it can do on play. Is that how I receive it at the board level? X is next squares on play with curly braces. With curly braces. Why? <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> okay. So we shifted from the I know what variable it is because of what order I received it to I know what variable it is because they were passed separately with explicit names. Boom, boom, boom. And those are the same names we see down here. Okay. And board is going to have handle click. So we're going to remove the first two lines of board. I see. We're removing the stuff before handle click. Hello, board. That stuff's gone. Set squares and set X's next. Those are no longer pieces of state that are handled at that level. So we got to change how we do it. With a single call to our new on play function so that game can update it. What is the goal of this next thing? To change where and how state is updated. Because we changed one thing already, where is state created? We moved it up from game, excuse me, from board to game. Now we need to change how state is updated. That's this function we're in the process of writing. And in that process, we need to move the logic for updating it up out of board, which the old way from the previous section is things like set X is next or set squares are ha still happening in board. We need to change that because right now that should all be happening up in game. So we have board, handle click, this all stays the same. Next squares. Okay. So it looks like we're updating this slightly. If X is next, next squares. Did we change it from squares to next squares then? Hmm. There we go. Cons, next squares. Cons, next squares. Yeah, we still have all that. Bada boom, bada bing. And then instead of set squares and set X is next, we're simply replacing it with this thing called on play. So goodbye to these. These will probably show up in a very similar kind of form up in the game level. For now, we're just going to call the on play function. Board is now ignorant. It's like, I don't know what on play is. It was given to me. And when I get here, I'm just going to do whatever that is. And it's relying on game to handle and process that. What it's passing in, in other words, what it's giving to game to be able to handle that processing is next squares. What the squares array should be next, where the game state is about to be. But now that we have a history array, I imagine that our on play function is going to say, all right, move to the next spot in our history array. And then whatever this next squares array is, save that. That's our new state. Don't overwrite the old one. Go down in the history array and then put it there. The board component is fully controlled by the props passed to it by game. So we need to implement handle play 
up at the game level. What does handle play do? Well, we need to do what set squares used to do. Handle play function needs to update game state. Uh huh. When state gets updated, in other words, when history, the variable of arrays, gets updated, there will be a re render and we'll see it on screen. But without set squares, we're going to use history. So let's append it. An array, you can append. That means, hey, however long the array is, make new room on the bottom. New spot doesn't exist yet. And then jam this stuff there. Push it onto the end. And we want to flip X's next, which we said a moment ago. We would also have to move up there. So yes, that part makes sense to me. Let's do this quick one. Handle play needs to set X's next. So let's come up to game. We're in game. Handle play. One thing we need to do is call this setter function set X's next. What are we setting it to? The opposite of whatever X is next currently is. Simple. This exclamation point is called bang in computer science. Hilarious. And we're saying set X is next to bang X is next. Sometimes, see the hard part about computer science is that you learn a language that's not always very human readable in order to be concise so that you can do lots of fancy wizardry stuff really fast. But the learning curve can be steep when the syntax of how to talk to the computer is awkward. So we're going to tolerate the awkwardness of this. And in exchange, we get a very concise way of saying to react, flip X is next. If it's X, if it's true, excuse me, because it's, uh, it's a Boolean. In other words, true or false. If it's true, make it false. If it's false, make it true. And update the entire screen to show that. That's a lot of powerful things that we're asking it to do with just a few characters. What else? In other words, don't feel bad if this looks like super hard to read and awkward. Like that's, that's part of learning how to do computer science. Uh, we're also going to need to set history. And then this is a little bit of JavaScript worth talking about. So we're calling the set history setter. Yeah, the setter to update the state of history, which is an array. Currently, it only has turn one in its zeroth index. And what it has there at the zeroth index is a array of nine nulls. The board state at turn one is an array of nine nulls. And that array of nine nulls is the first thing in the array called history. What we want to do is leave that there and then have the next thing in the history array be a new array of nine things where it's eight nulls and then an X wherever they clicked. For example, if they click in the top left, it already works. God dang. Then we would have I'm trying to find their example. Yeah. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. I can do it like that. Zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. Yeah. So now history looks like this. It's an array. The first thing, the zeroth thing, excuse me, is nine nulls. And then the first thing right after the zeroth thing is eight nulls. And then an X wherever X was clicked. In this example, the zero, one, two, three, fourth square. How do we do that though? Again, we tolerate the powerful brevity of syntax to gain the ability to say it quickly. This is called destructuring an array. MDN destructuring array. If you ever don't know JavaScript, throw MDN in front and then you'll be on the Mozilla Developer Network. 
This one? Give me the dot dot dot. There we go. There we go. Spread. That's what it's called. MDN spread. Spread. Great. So if you want to learn more about this dot 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 thing, go read up. In the meantime, we're just going to use it. We're going to spread the current history array out. Boom, 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 boom. And then right after it, we're going to have the next squares. Boom. That's the new game state. And then we're going to wrap that all up into an array. We're going to unpackage history. Do, 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 and then add one thing at the end. Do, and then call that what history should be now. It's pretty sick. <laughs> it's like... In terms of logic, like very quick and beautiful how they're doing this. But you need to understand spreading to understand how they did it. What did you mean no parens beam? Oh, you said that 12 <laughs> minutes ago, excuse me. All right, bada boom. What else we gotta do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So have we... Yes, we did this. We did handle play. Enumerate all the items in history. And then right after that, do whatever next squares is. Love it. Like it, love it, gotta have it. At this point, you've moved state to live in the game component and the UI should be fully working just as it was before the refactor. So we did a bunch of work to get back to where we were. And we did that so that we could do what we're going to do next. Okay, here's all of our code. I'm assuming we have this because we have this. Great. Showing the past. Now the fun part. Now the power. There was a feature request from the product manager. You need to be able to show the past moves. We haven't even begun to implement that. We had to do the pre-work of refactoring to be able to do that. React elements like button are regular JavaScript objects. You can pass them around in your application. To render multiple items in React, you can use an array of React elements. I'm reading it because I don't understand it. <laughs> Let's figure it out. You already have an array of history moves in state. So now you need to transform it into an array of React elements. Oh, this is gonna be that ordered list over on the side where, right, where do we render? Here we go, right here. So this, Does uh, does game handle this? Oh, good. Game handles it, so it knows about history. So history. Great. Um, what do I want to do? For each. For each element of history. I want to display an ordered list. So how do I not procedurally do this? How do I just do it like, like if there's two of these right next to each other, I should probably have it say something like thing. Thing, thing. Okay. The beginning of expected behavior. So I want like four each, is that a thing? In history. Nope, gotta JSX that.
I want it to be like a for loop that iterates for however long history is. And for however long that is, it pops out uh, an ordered list, an OL element. So what am I like? JavaScript for loop, uh, what would this be like? Cheat sheet. Like what are the different ways I can do that? Yeah, this is the simple one. List item. Thank you, Beam. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Text. So the first thing I want to do is display the word text. We're going to make this OL. And then I want in a list item. Okay, we're getting there. We don't need two ordered lists. That's the wrapper for the list. But we do need to close this ordered list. Okay, are we getting there? Okay, and then this is JSX. So it's complaining that we didn't tell it to expect JavaScript. Okay. What? Why are you not expecting JavaScript? I just gave you escape into JavaScript. <laughs> what am I what am I not understanding? <laughs> okay. Did I do the for loop wrong? For parentheses, close parentheses, for parentheses, close parentheses, bracket, bracket. Wow, uh, okay. Why is this not working? More parentheses. <laughs> not quite. Okay, fine. How do they do it? <laughs> map. Ah, uh, map's so much cleaner. Map. So here's how map works. If you have an array, which is here, usually this array would be saved as a variable name, such as array or history, but here they're doing it explicitly. Here's the array. It's got the numbers one, two, and three. Dot map. Map is a, what are they, it's a method that exists on the array prototype. In other words, you don't have to define what map is. It already exists, and you can do it on any array. So you go, whatever the array is, dot map to call the map function which all arrays know about and is available. And then you pass in this anonymous function that takes each element of the array, which we're gonna go one at a time. That's what mapping does, is it just whatever, uh, it, it grabs each element and holds it. We're giving it this name X for a moment. And then does, this is arrow function notation, if you don't know what that is, MDN arrow function will explain it to you. Does x times 2. And then the output of this would be that same array, but each element is being multiplied by 2. Lovely. Let's do that same thing, but instead of doing computation, let's output some list items. So one thing we're going to add under handle play is this function jump to next move. That's going to be a button we use in a moment. Let's get rid of this chaos. And then here's where it gets fun. Moves. Which happens before the return statement. Yes. Wait, what? Uh, yes, happens before the return statement. It itself has a return statement. Oh, 
Oh, glorious. So we're just calling it moves down here. Of course, Derek. Of course. We're not going to do the logic down here. That'd be too ugly. We got to do it up here in this thing called moves. I don't like this const moves. I want to call it like function moves. So this is just going to be a moves. Which is something that we define right up here. Beautiful. A little more room to breathe. Okay. How do I hide this? Yes. Great. Let's talk about it. What is moves? Take the history array and map each element of it. Each element of it we expect to also be an array that's nine long. And that is going to have two pieces. What is move? <laughs> that's not how I understand history works or how map works. What, what, uh, is squares the first thing? Let description. If move, okay. If moves greater than zero. Is this a thing that comes out of map? This like index thing? Tooltip, help me. Index. Oh, it is. Cool. It automatically generates an index of where we are in the mapping. I didn't know about that. This is one of those like optional parameters where if you didn't write it, it would still be existing but would be hidden from you. But if you go comma and then whatever you put here, this could be anything like move number. Uh, that's an index. It goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so what it's checking specifically is that uh, we're not on the 0 with 1. We start on the 0 with 1. On the 0 with 1, go to game start. But after the zero with one, in other words, when history is more than having a, the blank state, then it says, go to move number one. Oh, we haven't implemented time travel yet, of course. Conditional logic for what the button's description is. That text is right here. Text. So you could write normal text here in each list item, or you could write this variable notation and then let the variable be either this string or this string, depending on which move it is, which is an index that gets counted up as we map through the array of history. Let's make history even longer. Now, move has move zero, which triggers this description, move one, which triggers this description, and move, the variable shows one here, and also move two. The output of this function returns a, an element that gets displayed. It's a function and the output of the function is stuff to show on screen. And it changes how many stuffs depending on how long history is. These are buttons. You can click them, but nothing happens yet. Because button on click uh, is an anonymous arrow function that calls jump to whichever move what there we go oh description is displaying of course and the arrow would jump to that move cool however we haven't written jump to Uh, if y'all have any questions, just ask. I know I'm moving a little quickly through this, and that's because uh, normally these last an hour, and I'm going long because I want to finish implementing time travel before we wrap. Let's see how far we can get uh, down here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
We should see an error in the DevTools console that says warning each child in an array or iterator should have a unique key prop. Check the render method of game. Okay, do we have that? <laughs> what? Never in my life have I seen could not consume error. Error. Something is really wrong. That's hilarious. There we go. That's the error they predicted. We are failing for the right reasons. Excellent. Okay, that's what I just explained about how it checks how long history is and then for each thing, uh, puts out a little button over in our ordered list one two three four five that says go to game start go to move one go to move two etc depending on how long history is but what's this key error talking about picking a key when you render a list react stores some information about each rendered list item when you update a list react needs to determine what has changed you could have added, removed, rearranged, or updated the list's items. Imagine transitioning from these two list items, Alexa, seven tasks left, excuse me, and Ben, five tasks left. Tasks, tasks. To Ben, nine, Claudia, eight, and Alexa, five. A lot happened there. It used to be A and then B. Notice that they're doing the classic textbook thing. A, B, C. So it was A, B. Now, A is at the end, after B, and there's this new thing C in the middle. And the numbers are different for all of them. So how would React know that Ben five tasks left is the specific list item that got transformed into this one on the top, Ben nine tasks left? It's not smart enough to be able to figure that out. You gotta give each of these list items a key so that it can just check like, key value equals list item two or list item Ben so that if it needs to render Ben's with like his profile picture or something that it can know which one's Ben's the same Ben even after we change the order database IDs there we go key is user dot ID this is an example with the ABC use it da, 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 da. Great, so this is hidden from view. It's not rendered on the screen, but it does get um, added here in the list item open tag. If a component's key changes, the component will be destroyed and recreated with the new state. Interesting. So key is a special and reserved property in React. When the element's created, React extracts the key and stores it directly on the returned element. It looks like it's passed as props. React automatically uses key to decide which components to update. There's no way for a component to ask what key its parent specified. I don't understand the implications. But you should probably be using keys when you're building dynamic lists. If you're making a blog and for each blog post, you're creating this little like summary card over on the front page that people can scroll through and click which one they want to expand and read. Probably there should be something like blog ID. See you, Swade. If no key is specified, React will report an error and use the array index as the key by default. But that's problematic when you need to reorder the items in the array or add or remove items, which is common. So explicitly passing key equals I, that's the index array, silences the error, but it's not recommended. That's a bit of a janky workaround, don't do that. 
Keys do not need to be globally unique across the entire app. They only need to be unique between components and their siblings. In other words, if there's a parent component, such as game, and that has two components, board and turns over on the side, board and turns are siblings, and they should not be using similar uh, key names, like key A, key B, key C, key A, key B, key C. That'll confuse it. Okay, so how do we create unique keys to solve this problem? In our game history, each move has a unique ID. It's which turn number it was. That's nice, it's built in by default. Moves will never be reordered, deleted, or inserted in the middle, so we can use the index as the key in this case. you can add the key as in the list item, key equals move, key equals move. Okay, list item, where'd you go? Where does list item live? Over in game, over in return, yep, list item. And here, our console gets quiet. But now we need to talk about jump to. So in order to have jump to work, we need a new variable called current move. That way, if we jump back to turn five and then somebody clicks a new square, we update we go all the way back in history array to that spot and then update at the turn five location, not turn 10 or whatever would be at the very end. So we need a way to keep track of what we're jumping to so that if we change the course of history, we know where the course of history gets changed. So we'll make a new thing called current move up at the game level. And then uh, current move starts at zero. Update jump to inside game to update current move. Mm -hmm. You'll also set X's next to true. Oh. When we jump to a different part of the game, we need to know who's next, X or zero. Well, it depends. One cheat we can use to do it pretty easily is set X's next. If it's an even move, then set it to true if the number you're changing it to is even. If we're changing it to turn zero, yes, X is next. If we're changing it to one, no, X is not next. That's an odd number and O is next and so on for turns two through nine or two through eight. Okay, so inside jump to, now we have some logic. Lovely. Uh, if you don't know what this syntax means, Modulo, remainder, the remainder operator. I recommend you go check it out. It's a neat little division tool. And now we're gonna make two changes to handle play. If we go back in time and then make a new move, we only want the history up to that point. Instead of adding next squares after all the items in the spread syntax in history, you'll add it after all the items in history dot slice. Uh-huh. So we're chopping, like let's say it's after turn nine and history is nine long, but we jump to move five and then we click a new thing and that's the new move five. Well, then we only want to grab turn zero through four in history, we wanna slice a certain chunk of history, not the whole thing, and then after that slice, we'll add on this new turn five. 
That's what this logic is doing. We slice it from the beginning to whatever move we're on plus one because that's a counting at zero thing. Cool. So this all goes at the top of handle play. In addition to? No. Oh, we updated how... I got confused about the difference between jump to and handle play. So what did we just change? We had set history and set X is next. Now we have set history and set X is next and set current move, which uses next history, a thing we figure out right here. Neat. Finally, we'll modify the game component to render the currently selected move instead of whatever the final move is. Current squares is history, current move. Current squares is history, not whatever's at the end, but whatever the current move is. X, O, X. Can we go back and make it here instead? Can we go back and make it here instead? Can we go back and make it here instead? Wow. Lovely. Beautiful. If you look at the code very closely, you may notice that uh, the X is next is strictly equal to true when current move is even, and x is next is false when current moves odd. In other words, if you know what number current move is, what, what the current move is, <laughs> he explained poorly, <laughs> you can always figure out what x is next should be. Therefore, we don't need them as two separate things. x is next is deterministically figure outable based on current move. Current move is the turn number. X is next just changes depending on whether or not that's odd or even. So we don't even need an X is next. So let's not have redundant state. X is next instead of being its own bit of state is now just going to be whatever the remainder is of current move divided by two. Sorry. Oh, that's clever. Let's take a closer look. X is next will be set equal to whether this is strictly equal to zero, whether there is no remainder after current move is divided by two. So if current move is four, the remainder after you divide four by two is zero and this statement evaluates to true. Yes, it is the case that four remainder two, four divided by two has a remainder of zero, and therefore x is next is true. But if it was turn five and you divide by two, then there's a remainder of one, and one is not strictly equal to zero, and so this evaluates to false. Beautifully concise logic, hard to think about, easy to write. So where is that living? Here. Why are these highlighted? X is next. And then we have to put it under current move. Ah. That's why it highlighted those. <laughs> In 
jump to. Did I get the one in jump to? I did. Okay. We did it. We made a tic-tac-toe game that lets us play tic-tac-toe, indicates when someone wins, keeps track of the entire turn history throughout the game, and allows people to jump back and view it to see which one was move five or move six, and from that place in the past, change the course of history moving forward. We hope you now feel like you have a decent grasp of how React works. Here are some extensions. Uh, Beam, you will not be able to do that because the history array, sorry, question was, if you play four moves, jump back to move one and change the move that was played, what's the result when you jump forward to the original move four? Let's try it out. X, O, X. So we played four moves. Uh, let's play four moves. And then jump back to move one and then change what was played. What is the result when you jump forward to the original move four? We can no longer do that. And the reason we can no longer do that is that after we jumped back in history, when we changed this slice part, here. So we updated handle play, which is when the click happens. And <laughs> the good news is the quality assurance has been taken care of because we set history and we lose the future. We're only slicing out the bit of history that goes up to current move, that variable that we keep track of. So current move is currently like six or six. And so if we go back, current move is now one. And so if I want to change history with set history, then it's only going to grab the slice of zero to, to zero and then append this next move to it. We lose what was the rest of history right here. Okay. And that's React. I'm excited because uh, Front End Wednesdays will continue to be a thing, but rather than it being a React tutorial next week, we actually have a special guest, Vito Rivabella from uh, Alchemy. You know, Alchemy. Probably not the best thing to search. Ah, it is. They have alchemy.com. So uh, Vito Rivabella from Alchemy is going to join us and talk about what, um, what Alchemy has been up to and help us improve our front end skills uh, in a specific way. If you don't know what um, Alchemy does, they help front end developers query the blockchain and be like, hey, blockchain, what is going on? And also be like, hey, blockchain. This person wants to do a swap on Uniswap. And the blockchain's like, thanks for letting me know. I'll go put that in the mempool. There's a lot that happens in between somebody's browser, like their phone or their desktop, and state getting updated on the blockchain. And Alchemy is that middle layer that helps communicate between uh, front ends for dApps and the blockchain itself updating its state. Uh, Merman, what were you talking about? That's the NFT. Not sure. This concludes today's Front End Wednesday. Uh, I'm at the Derek on Twitter. Follow me. You're in their Discord. Hmm. Um, you can ask lots of questions of uh, Vito next week. Um, and as a reminder, I said this at the beginning, we have special guest Nather Dobbit tomorrow. Yay, Twitter. Uh, Nather, a oh, Dabit three. 
We have Nather Dobbit. Yay. He's one of my dreams. Nother dot lens. He's gonna be talking to us about lens protocol. Uh which is like um Web3 social graph. So that's kind of cool. We might even talk about Lenster, which is a play on Friendster, a like proto social media platform before Facebook. Uh, but more specifically, we're going to be talking about lens. And maybe I'll even get my dot lens on the spot. I still don't have one. <laughs> Imagine. Okay. Uh, until then, you know where to find me. Um, at the Derek. And I'm also Derek in the Discord. And apply to Camp Biddle. I definitely want to see y'all at Camp Biddle. Oh, I realized I wasn't sharing my screen during that last. Nother Dobbit. My hero, Lens Protocol, Lens is great. Okay, that's the part you missed. Also, apply to Camp Biddle. I want to see you there. 10-day boot camp during Eat Denver. It's free. World-class education. We're talking Vitalik, Austin Griffith, Nather Dobbit, and Patrick Collins, and others. Four different tracks. No background experience required. Other than the two technical tracks, it'd be nice if you had ever used a programming language before, uh, including basic JavaScript would be good enough. Or at least my self-taught JavaScript, like the kinds of stuff I'm showing you, like, wait, how does this work? What's free code camp? What's MDM? That was good enough for me to be able to take advantage of some of the lessons that are going to be in this boot camp. The goal of the boot camp is we take noobs and bring you from zero to hero, and you go participate in ETH Denver and biddle a project, make some friends, win some money, Whatever your goals are, we would love to see you there. So tell your friends about ethnumber.com forward slash camp biddle. Please and thanks. Okay. Oh. Oh, great question, Army of the 12 Monkeys. What time does the boot camp occur, especially the front end one? Is it only virtual? It is not virtual at all. It's only in person. It will not be filmed or streamed. Tough cookies. And uh, I'm covering my own face. <laughs> LOL. There we go. Um, it's, uh, it's from the 24th to the 1st is like the hands-on learning part is during Biddle Week. And then we just set you free to go participate in ETH Denver's core event, the biddle -a So there's no instruction or anything during the March 2nd to March 5th when everyone's biddling and biddling and biddling so to answer your question on friday and saturday it'll be all day but then on sunday monday tuesday wednesday it'll be half days you'll either be in the morning cohort or the afternoon cohort it'll it'll be four hour days sunday monday tuesday wednesday and we did that so that folks could also do other stuff during <laughs> biddle week there's a lot of stuff inside events happening and we understand you probably don't just want to have this sick ass course you probably also want to enjoy the sick ass other stuff going on so uh let me know if you have follow-up questions about that make sure you apply though i'm sending out the first wave of acceptances soon trademark symbol <laughs> until then thank you for joining me on front end wednesdays i am as always derek your community steward bye